When you think of America's great family fortunes, tales of oil barons, railroad tycoons, and industrial pioneers usually come to mind. But in the quiet corridors of academic medicine, three brothers from Brooklyn were building something different, a pharmaceutical empire that would eventually make them one of the nation's wealthiest families. Their path to riches wasn't paved with steel or oil, but with something far more subtle, the art of medical marketing and pain management. By the 1990s, the Sackler name adorned the walls of Harvard, Oxford and the Louvre, their philanthropy establishing them among society's elite. Yet, beneath this glittering surface of charitable giving and cultural patronage, their company Purdue Pharma was developing marketing strategies that would revolutionize how America treated pain and ultimately trigger one of the most devastating public health crises in the nation's history. In today's episode, we'll tell their full saga, from humble immigrant roots to the heights of financial finesse, all the way back down, as we describe. The Sackler Family when $10 billion can't save your legacy. In the opulent yet controversial realm of the Sackler dynasty, wealth isn't merely displayed, it's practically dripping from the chandeliers. Indeed, we're talking about a family that makes the Rockefellers look like bargain hunters at a Sunday market, with a fortune reaching a staggering 10 billion US dollars as of last year. And while most billionaires can't resist flaunting their status on social media, the Sacklers prefer the subtle approach. That is, of course, if you can call a $40 million Belgravia townhouse subtle, and thus their real estate portfolio reads like a Monopoly player's fever dream. A $50 million Manhattan apartment that makes Park Avenue look pedestrian. And naturally, darling, a Hamptons estate. Because where else would one summer, as they say? And when they tire of terra firma, they simply hop aboard their private jets, plural, mind you, flitting between their alpine ski lodge and their private Pacific island, like most of us, change television channels. But where the Sacklers truly flex their financial muscles is in the art world. Their collection would make entire nations blush with envy, spanning everything from ancient Egyptian artifacts to contemporary masterpieces. And they're not mere collectors, they're veritable cultural kingmakers. The Sackler name adorns the halls of the world's most prestigious institutions, including the Louvre, the Met, the V&A. And they've scattered their largesse across these temples of culture like confetti at a billionaire's wedding. Take the Sackler wing at the Met, housing the Temple of Dender, a mere $3.5 million donation in the 1970s, now worth north of 20 million. And their philanthropy extends into the hallowed halls of academia. Yale, Oxford, Harvard, all bearing the Sackler stamp of approval. Medical research centers, professorships, scholarships, they've funded them all with the casual ease of someone ordering breakfast. But here's the delicious irony, dear viewers. This family, so adept at crafting an image of sophisticated beneficence, harbors a rather fascinating, if dark, origin story for their vast fortune. And that, as they say in all the best circles, is where things get properly interesting. Before the wonderful world of riches and cacophony of controversial cover stories, there was nothing remarkable about the Brooklyn street where Isaac and Sophie Sackler made their home in the early 1900s. And like thousands of other Jewish immigrants fleeing the pogroms of Eastern Europe, they had come to America seeking sanctuary, seeking hope. The street teemed with push carts and the shouts of vendors, with children playing stickball in the gathering dusk, with the smell of chicken soup wafting from tenement windows. Isaac Sackler stood behind the counter of his grocery store day after day, measuring out pounds of sugar and flour, counting pennies, trying to provide for his family in this new world. But in that modest grocery store, amid the barrels of pickles and shelves of canned goods, three sons were growing up who would transform American medicine, Arthur, Mortimer, and Raymond Sackler. And it was Arthur, the eldest, born in 1913, who would show the first signs of the startling ambition that would come to define the family's legacy. Even as a boy, Arthur Sackler's intelligence burned with an unusual intensity. At 17, while other neighborhood boys were taking jobs in factories or following their fathers into trade, Arthur entered New York University to study medicine. But for Arthur Sackler, simply becoming a doctor was not enough. He saw something that others did not. 
the vast potential that lay in the intersection of medicine and marketing. The young doctor's first position was at Creedmoor State Hospital in New York, where he began conducting experiments not just in medicine, but in the art of influence. He promoted controversial treatments like frontal lobotomies and electroconvulsive therapy, watching carefully how doctors responded to his persuasion. But it was in the 1940s and 50s that Arthur Sackler would revolutionize the very foundation of how drugs were sold in America. At that time, pharmaceutical companies relied on an army of salesmen who trudged from doctor's office to doctor's office, sample cases in hand. Arthur Sackler saw this system for what it was, inefficient, outdated, ripe for transformation. Through his medical advertising agency, William Douglas McAdams, he pioneered a new approach. His advertisements in medical journals spoke to doctors in their own language, weaving scientific data and medical terminology into compelling narratives that demanded attention. The true genius of his strategy revealed itself in the marketing campaign for Pfizer's antibiotic teramycin. It was unlike anything the medical community had seen before, a sophisticated symphony of direct mail, journal advertisements and radio promotions that turned a new drug into a blockbuster success. This campaign would become the template for modern pharmaceutical marketing, and it made Arthur Sackler a very wealthy man indeed. But Arthur was not content with merely advertising to doctors. He began sponsoring medical education programs, creating a subtle web of influence that would shape how physicians prescribed medications for decades to come. And watching this success with keen interest were his younger brothers, Mortimer and Raymond, who saw in their brothers' innovations the blueprint for an empire. In the gleaming offices of Madison Avenue, where Arthur Sackler had built his medical advertising empire, his younger brothers Mortimer and Raymond watched, and they learned. They saw how their brilliant brother had transformed pharmaceutical marketing from a crude door-to-door -door operation into a sophisticated machine of influence. They understood, with the sharp clarity that comes from watching greatness up close, that medicine was no longer just about healing, it was about selling. The year was 1952 when the brothers made their move. The company they purchased, Purdue Frederick, was hardly impressive. A small manufacturer of earwax remover and laxatives, operating out of a modest facility, its name barely known beyond a handful of pharmacies. But in this unremarkable business, the Sacklers saw possibility. They saw a foundation upon which an empire could be built. Step by step, product by product, they began to expand. Over-the-counter medications, antiseptics. Each success only fueled their ambition. But it was the acquisition of MS Contin in the 1970s that revealed the true scope of their vision. This extended-release morphine pill, primarily used for cancer patients, showed them the path forward. Here was the future. Not in humble earwax removers, but in the vast, untapped market of pain management. By 1996, with Arthur increasingly distant from day-to-day -day operations, Mortimer and Raymond were ready to unveil their masterpiece, OxyContin. The drug represented everything the brothers had learned about both medicine and marketing. Its time-release formula was innovative, yes, but it was the marketing campaign that would truly set it apart. Here, in the shadows of their brother's legacy, they would launch one of the most aggressive pharmaceutical promotions in American history. The scale of the operation was staggering. Purdue Pharma, as their company was now known, deployed an army of sales representatives that outnumbered even pharmaceutical giant Pfizer's forces. These representatives moved through doctor's offices like well-trained soldiers, armed not with guns but with samples, studies and carefully crafted messages minimizing addiction risks. The campaign was orchestrated with military precision. Doctors were flown to luxurious resorts for educational seminars. Promotional videos featuring satisfied patients found their way into thousands of medical offices. The message was clear, consistent, and, as would later become tragically apparent, devastatingly effective. OxyContin was different. OxyContin was safer. OxyContin was the future of pain management. The numbers told the story. In 1996, OxyContin generated 48 million in sales, and by the year 2000, that figure had exploded to 1.1 billion. Doctors who had once been cautious about prescribing opioids now wrote prescriptions for everything from routine back pain to minor arthritis. The Sackler brothers had not just created a successful drug, 
they had transformed the very landscape of pain treatment in America. The wealth that flowed from this success was almost beyond comprehension. The Sackler family's fortune swelled into the billions. Their name appeared on museum wings, university buildings, and prestigious medical research centers. They became patrons of the arts, donors to prestigious institutions, philanthropists of the highest order. But beneath this glittering surface of success, something darker was brewing. In doctors' offices, in pharmacies, and in homes across America, a crisis was taking root, one that would eventually reveal the true cost of the Sackler's ambition. By the dawn of the new millennium, the Sackler family seemed untouchable. Their name graced the wings of the world's greatest museums, their philanthropy opened doors in the highest echelons of society, their wealth appeared limitless. But beneath this golden facade in small towns and rural communities across America, something dark was stirring. The first warnings came from places far from the marble halls of the Louvre or the pristine corridors of the Smithsonian. They came from emergency rooms in Appalachia, from police stations in New England, from funeral homes in the Rust Belt. People were crushing OxyContin tablets, destroying the time-release mechanism that was supposed to make the safer, and snorting or injecting the for an instant, overwhelming. At first, in their gleaming corporate offices, Purdue Farmers executives, guided by the Sackler family, dismissed these reports as mere anomalies. They pointed to their carefully worded warning labels, to their marketing materials that stressed proper use. But in county after county, state after state, the evidence was mounting, and it told a different story. What the Sacklers had known, what internal documents would later reveal they had always known, was that OxyContin's main ingredient, oxycodone, was chemically similar to heroin. When abused, it created the same devastating The time-release formula, far from being a safety mechanism, was little more than a paper shield against the fundamental nature. And the consequences were devastating. In small towns where OxyContin abuse took hold, police chiefs watched helplessly as crime rates soared. Families that had lived honest, hard-working lives for generations now saw their children turn to theft, to prostitution, to any means necessary to feed their emergency room doctors who had believed the company's assurances about the drug's safety now fought a losing battle against an endless tide of overdoses. When investigations finally began, they revealed a strategy of calculated deception. Internal memos showed executives discussing ways to maximize profits, even as reports of abuse multiplied. Sales representatives had been trained to downplay addiction risks, to push the drug for everything from backaches to dental work. The marketing machine that Arthur Sackler had built, now wielded by his brother's company, had been turned into a weapon of mass deception. The year 2007 marked the first crack in the Sackler Fortress. Purdue Farmer pleaded guilty to criminal charges of misbranding OxyContin, paying $600 million in fines. But this was merely the beginning. As America's opioid crisis deepened, as death tolls mounted and communities crumbled, state after state filed lawsuits against both the company and the family. The same media that had once celebrated the Sacklers now turned its investigative lens upon them. Journalists dug through thousands of documents, interviewed hundreds of victims, and painted a portrait of a family that had knowingly profited from human suffering on an industrial scale. The great cultural institutions that had once competed for Sackler donations now faced a reckoning of their own. The family name, once a symbol of enlightened philanthropy, became toxic. Museum wings that had proudly borne the Sackler name for decades were quietly renamed. The letters pried off marble facades like bandages from a wound. For the Sackler family, who had risen from the immigrant neighborhoods of Brooklyn to the pinnacle of American society, a harsh truth was becoming clear. Their empire, built on the foundation of pain management, had instead created an edifice of suffering that would overshadow their name for generations to come. By 2010, the mighty Sackler dynasty found itself facing an unfamiliar sensation, vulnerability. The family that had orchestrated one of the most successful pharmaceutical marketing campaigns in history now watched as their carefully constructed facade crumbled piece by piece, revelation by revelation. The younger Sacklers, who had grown up in Manhattan penthouses and Hampton estates, surrounded by rare art and chauffeured in private cars, confronted a harsh new reality. 
Their inheritance was no longer merely measured in billions of dollars, but in hundreds of thousands of shattered lives, in communities torn apart, in a nation ravaged by addiction. In 2019, in a gleaming corporate boardroom far removed from the devastated rural towns where their product had wreaked such havoc, Purdue Pharma's executives announced what would have once seemed unthinkable, bankruptcy. The company, facing an avalanche of lawsuits from states, cities, and countless broken families, proposed a settlement. They would restructure as a public benefit company, with future profits directed toward treating the very epidemic they had helped create. The settlement's numbers were staggering. $4.5 billion from the Sackler family, paid over nine years. Yet to critics, these billions represented mere pennies on the dollars the family had extracted from America's pain. In congressional hearings, family members attempted to deflect responsibility. David Sackler, Raymond's grandson, claimed ignorance of OxyContin's dangers. Kathy Sackler, before stunned lawmakers, insisted that Purdue bore no responsibility for the crisis, words that echoed through the chamber like a mockery of the hundreds of thousands dead. The repudiation of the Sacklers spread like wildfire through the cultural institutions they had once dominated. The Louvre, that great palace of culture in Paris, was the first to act, stripping the Sackler name from its walls in 2019. Others followed. The Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, the Tate in London, the Guggenheim. One by one, the family's name was chiseled off marble facades, removed from wing after wing, gallery after gallery. Even in the hallowed halls of academia, where the Sackler name had purchased prestige for decades, change came. Yale University, which had accepted millions in Sackler donations, announced in 2021 that it would rename its Institute for Biological, Physical and Engineering Sciences. The very institutions that had once competed for Sackler money now raced to distance themselves from the taint of their legacy. Yet even as their name was being erased from the temples of high culture, the Sacklers remained almost unfathomably wealthy. Forbes estimated their fortune at $10.8 billion in 2020, a fortune built pill by pill, prescription by prescription, death by death. Some younger family members attempted to separate themselves from this toxic legacy. Elizabeth Sackler, Arthur's daughter, publicly denounced Purdue Pharma. But such individual acts of conscience did little to stem the tide of public outrage. The story of the Sacklers had become more than just another tale of American capitalism gone wrong. It stood as a symbol of the devastating consequences of unchecked greed, to the failure of regulatory systems, to the corruption of medical practice by marketing dollars. And now, we'd like to see you in the comments. Had you been familiar with the Sackler family prior to this video, or is this all a shock to you? We can't wait to hear your thoughts, and thanks again for joining us for another episode of Old Money Luxury. With that said, cheers. Until next time.